Welcome to today's MAR Colloquium. The topic is access to public records, tensions between the right to know and the protection of privacy, and the role of records management in addressing these issues. Our speaker is Trevor Lewis, a records analyst from the Vermont Archives and Records Administration for Vermont State Archives. Uh, I am especially pleased to introduce Trevor uh, today because he has a unique perspective on records management. Uh, he was a practicing licensed lawyer and uh, he can bring that uh, legal perspective as well as the records management perspective to his presentation today. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the mic over to Trevor. Trevor? Thank you, Pat. Good morning to those folks who are joining us from out west, and good afternoon to everybody who's um, east of that time zone change. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to join you all today, and a lot of the slides and the things that I'm going to be speaking about are intended as kind of information and food for thought, but I very much value the ability to have some dialogue here as well. Um, if there are questions on something that is particularly unclear as I'm going through it, or if there's a something that somebody has a real urgent desire to add, please feel free to ask to do that. I guess I'd like to ask Pat for um, some help in giving me a heads up when that's going on in case I get on a roll and don't notice it. Um, by way of background, as Pat mentioned, I'm a lawyer. I've been practicing law for about 20 years, and I've worked for municipal governments, state governments, and in private practice for a number of businesses. I've seen a lot of situations over the years where there have been real train wrecks as the result of a lack of records management. I've sometimes been there with clients at um, very late hours of the night or on weekends dealing with sifting records after things have already kind of hit a crisis point, and that really put an exclamation point for me on the, the importance of records management. I've been working here at Vermont State Archives and Records Administration for about two years, and um, working in the field of records management has been humbling in a really good way in that it really, um, I greatly admire the, the range and depth and variety of skill, talent, and knowledge of the folks that are in this field. Um, you may find at various points that I'm sort of preaching to the choir, because I know a lot of the audience here is in the field of records management, and I'll probably be extolling the virtues of it a lot. Um, that's partly because, from what I've seen, lawyers in particular are very good at managing conflict or managing process. They're not very good at managing records, and they're probably even worse at managing information. It tends to be only after the crisis arises. So anyway, um, after that sort of intro, maybe a little bit long-winded, that's a professional hazard in my line of work, um, what we're going to talk about today is some of the legal background that sort of underlies or informs records management, and in particular, the tensions between the right to know and the protection of privacy and how records management is a solution to many of these important issues. One of the baseline concepts is that we all live in a democracy, whether it be our federal government or our state or local governments, and for democracy to really work, you need to have information on what the government is doing, how it's doing it, or why it's doing it. And at the same time, especially as society becomes ever more complex, the government holds a tremendous amount of information. Um, you can think of our tax forms. You can think of various health information that's held by the government, um, situations where many businesses, one way or another, have to file some fairly detailed information with the government, especially if they're a regulated field. And so it, it's critical that the public be able to know what the government is doing and why the government is doing it. And at the same time, it's also critical that the government do a good job of protecting information that really doesn't reflect on the government and solely relates to sensitive private matters of an individual or a business. Now, the, um, the, the approach for many people in government, and I would say actually particularly lawyers, um, there's that old, uh, the, the bad idea of the what if, of I better keep everything just in case somebody ever asks for it. And what has become ever more apparent, especially as we're in this age where the, the range and amount of information just keeps increasing, is that when people cr keep everything, 
it creates much greater risks of an actual improper breach of confidentiality. Um, sometimes if there's so much to search through, people just say, oh, well, I'll hand it all over, and then they don't realize till later that there could be some sensitive things in there. The uh, What I call the burden of searching the haystack. Um, sometimes you get a public records request that says, I want all documents of any sort or any time relating to topic X, Y, Z, and then you've got to search everything from the, uh, the file boxes to the hard drive to the social media and so on. Um, if, if you've kept all the things you don't need to keep, that's a much more daunting task. The other thing is, I guess, what I call unmanageable opacity, um, the, the simple fact that you get so much information that you really just can't wrap your mind around it or it becomes hard to have systems that can really track it. So. Um, Again, I'm probably preaching to the choir, speaking to people in the field of records management, but um, it, it's so important to sift out the things that you don't need because it makes it that much easier to take care of and find the things that you do need. So again, here's sort of defined as a problem and an answer, um, just the way that we have lots of information and it only keeps increasing. Um, we really have no choice but to manage it. And I, I encourage people um, when I'm talking to people in government about thinking of information as an asset. You know, if, if you had an asset in the way of valuable mechanical parts or other things, you wouldn't just leave it lying around in a pile. You would, uh, you would take care of it. And really, we need to do the same thing with information. So. The backdrop for a lot of issues in government and also in records management has to do with our legal structure. Our legal structure in the United States is um, tremendously innovative, tremendously versatile, and has given us a lot of um, a lot of freedoms and a lot of progress in terms of private and public innovation. But it's also pretty complicated. We have the constitutions, which are really the backdrop, and they exist at both the federal and state level. There are the statutes passed by our legislatures. There are agency regulations that have the force of law when implemented properly by different government agencies. And then there's something known as the common law articulated by the courts. And it's really not written down in any single place. It often reaches far, far back into things that even predate the existence of the US, sometimes English common law. All of these things interact in various ways. I'll try to kind of hit some of the high points. Um, United States Constitution, easy to apply because it applies everywhere. Um, also easy to apply because it overrides anything that conflicts with it. Now, sometimes the question of how you define what conflicts with it can be sort of complicated. But um, in those situations where it sets a clear standard, it governs over everything else. What's interesting is that nothing in the United States Constitution actually comes out and talks about a right to access government records, uh, nor does anything in the Constitution speak to a, explicitly to a right to privacy. There, there is a provision against unreasonable searches and seizures that um, the police can't just come into your home without a warrant. But it really, that it, the, it's kind of interesting when you look at the context of the the Constitution's dealings with privacy it tended to think much more of a place and less about the content of information. And that's completely understandable given what, um, you know, at, at the time, if you had records, you knew where they were and they were probably within your home or your business. Today, we have a much more complex setting of many pieces of information being held in many locations. So um, that's the Constitution. Then we have state constitutions, and the interesting thing to realize is that the states as legal entities actually predate the federal government. They're kind of really the fundamental building block, even though the US Constitution overrules other things. Um, state constitutions are highly unique. They vary a lot because they, uh, just as states become states at different times, um, the constitutions date from different eras. They reflect the culture and values of each state. State constitutions always override any contrary state law, and they always regulate the conduct of state and usually local governments. Occasionally, some states have what's called home rule, and that's a little bit, little bit of a variation on the theme. But state constitutions never limit the contract conduct of the federal government. Interestingly, state constitutions do sometimes include an explicit recognition of a right to access government information, and they sometimes also 
contain an explicit recognition of the right of privacy. What you'll find again is that state constitutions vary tremendously, so if you're working in a particular state, you probably want to become familiar with what the provisions are on these topics. Um, and it's kind of interesting because many of the state constitutions really were I wouldn't, it wouldn't be quite accurate to say that they were dormant, but people didn't really look at them all that much until maybe 20 or 30 years ago, and then they've, they've been, many people have sort of revived the idea of looking at the state constitution as a, something to come up with governing standards for some of these very issues about government accountability or privacy. So it's, it's an interesting field, and it's a field where people can sometimes um, create some innovation and progress by looking at these things. Okay, um, I'm going to try really hard to not make this a Vermont-centered presentation, but sometimes I've got to pull from examples, and so I will use the, uh, the Vermont Constitution. It, it actually borrows a lot from the Pennsylvania Constitution. Um, the Vermont Constitution comes right out and says that basically because the government exists only for the people, all officers of government are servants and are therefore at all times in a legal way accountable to them. That's really the backdrop of our, our access to records here in Vermont. You will probably find something that's similar at least in concept, although it may vary a lot in detail, in most state constitutions. Now um, federal statutes, these are the laws passed by Congress and um, what's interesting, again, we, we tend to think in the modern era of the federal government as being this massive um, and incredibly wide-ranging part of government, and so we, we actually sometimes lose sight of the fact that under our Constitution, um, the federal government only has certain powers given to it by the federal Constitution with the agreement of states. A as a practical matter, those powers have come to encompass a huge range of things, um, but so anyway, the, the Federal laws always regulate the conduct of the federal government. They sometimes regulate the conduct of state and local government, and that um, that becomes somewhat complex. Um, there, there isn't a there isn't really a basis to regulate every single move of state or local government. So what the Congress tends to do is that um, sometimes they regulate state and local government by what I refer to as carrots. That's a situation where the um, federal government makes money available, but it says this money is available if and only if you agree to live by these federal mandates. Sometimes, and this is actually less common, the federal government regulates the conduct of state and local government by what I refer to as sticks or prohibitions and penalties. Um, sometimes you can get quite the, uh, quite the crazy quilt of carrots and sticks, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on as well. So on the federal level, um, lots of people have heard of the acronym FOIA, which F-O-I-A stands for the Freedom of Information Act. This is a federal law that was passed in the 1970s. It requires the federal government and its agencies to make many types of government records available on request. Um, this is a law that does not apply to state and local governments. This is something that is um, kind of widely misunderstood by the public and sometimes even people within government and the media. Um, the Federal Freedom of Information Act applies to the federal government, as we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, there are situations where typically states often have their own one, but it, it isn't, um, you, you can't assume that the, the federal standards govern anything on the state and local level. Here are some references if you want to um, look it up. The FOIA.gov site has a lot of different resources that you can fo follow as well. So in terms of the underlying purpose of the FOIA, it's really a lot like some of the constitutional concepts we talked about earlier. Um, the courts have said it's the, basically the goal is to ensure an informed citizenry, to make sure that the government remains accountable um, so that the government just doesn't begin to take on its own momentum without any accountability. There's also a federal law known as the Privacy Act of 1974. Again, this only applies to federal government agencies, and it basically allows the public to request the government as to what information the government holds about us. It also creates privacy requirements that the government is not supposed to release information without actually um, getting the consent of the individual. So uh, again, that only applies to the federal government. State statutes, again, these will vary by state and they really reflect the, the legal background and also the political and 
values, culture of each state. They carry out each state's constitutional and public policy requirements as to the access of government information and the protection of individual privacy. It is not unusual for the statutes to go further than the state constitution in requiring openness. And again, it's really important to get to know the details of the state or states that you're dealing with because all of the details about what's available, what's exempt, timelines, penalties, those sorts of things will all vary considerably by state. On the state level, these laws, people often use kind of the, um, the, the loose reference of calling these Freedom of Information Act. Um, it's important to understand that in most cases, that's actually not the title or name of the state law. If people use that term, usually people will kind of have a pretty good understanding of what what you're referring to, but I would really encourage people to try, try to learn the name of your law and try to use the name of your law and encourage others to. It, it helps keep it clearer and helps keep it grounded in what the law in your state really is. So state statutes, another thing that's important to realize is that most states have public records laws which guarantee the availability of documents, records, in various forms. Um, they, they most often apply not only to paper but to all sorts of other media and the ever unfolding array of new, new information and media. There are also public meetings laws which allow the public to know what's going to be conducted at a meeting and to be able to attend a meeting. People often become sort of confused um, as to these. It, it's really important to maintain the distinction. They both promote transparency and accountability, but they are separate laws and it's important to keep that separate. It is interesting with technology that we have, um, we have ways in which these laws bump up against each other more than ever before. I often get questions from local, um, in Vermont we have select boards, there's sort of the, uh, the legislature on a town by town basis and increasingly people realize that when they start having a set of email discussions that include a number of people that would constitute a quorum of the select board, all of a sudden they really have to be awfully careful that they're not getting into the territory of something where they would be required to have a public meeting. Um, and the same thing in this day and age, public meetings generate a lot more documents. So there, there is some overlap, but it's important to retain the distinction. So turning to Vermont's public records law, and again, not to make this totally centered on Vermont, but just as context, again, it, it reflects the idea that the officers of government are trustees and servants of the people. And it comes right out and says it's in the public interest to enable any person to review and criticize their decisions, even though such examination may cause inconvenience or embarrassment. Um, something I'll mention that's the law in Vermont, and I would expect it's the law in many other places too, so just food for thought. Um, many times people that are presented with a records request, it can feel very daunting and sometimes the situation can become very adversarial and the person who has to respond to the request or the agency can feel rather put on the defensive and feel like, well, they only want that because they want to embarrass us. And what I always remind people of is it doesn't matter what the motive is, um, whether the motive is noble, whether the motive is something other than noble, if the information is publicly available, then it is available regardless of who's asking. Something else that is in our law and is in most states' laws is recognition that all people do have a right to privacy in their personal and economic pursuits which ought to be protected unless that information is needed to review the action of the government. Something else as a background principle, federal law and most state laws start with the assumption that all records held by government are open to examination unless there's a specific exemption somewhere in law. The exemptions are usually spelled out in statute. Um, in our situation in Vermont, there's one statute that lists quite a number of them, but what gets a little more complicated is it also says, and any other materials made confidential by either state or federal law. So then you actually have to kind of go forth and consider what other law may apply. Um, another area that kind of gets to be a little bit of a trap for people is that sometimes someone presented with a public records request, the custodian of the record will say, it's not really clear that I should give this out. And at least in Vermont, our Supreme Court has said over and over again that 
if it's a gray area, they're going to resolve the doubt in favor of public access to the information. So what I always kind of try to remind people to think of is that at least here, and you'll want to check your own state, but at least here, if it's a gray area, it actually is probably not a gray area. Something else to realize is that these laws are frequently changing. Um, there are many situations where there will be public controversies or court cases that sometimes will cause people to realize that the law didn't envision some situation or maybe it did envision it but times have changed so um, I, I pretty much tell people and I myself I never go from memory when it comes to the exemptions it's something where I want to look at it and I want to look and see what it is now because for all I know it could be different than it was just a few months ago so some common types of exemptions, and these are things you'll find pretty much in the federal law and in most state laws, recognition for private financial or sensitive personal information, tax information, trade secrets, health information, contracts that are still in the midst of negotiation, usually once it's final they're open, um, judicial or quasi-judicial deliberations, that obviously includes courts and juries, uh, but it also to a very huge extent includes administrative agencies when they're in a role that's analogous to a judicial role where they're deciding what's referred to as a contested case. Um, law enforcement investigations, at least while the investigation is ongoing, whether or not those law enforcement investigations, whether that information is available after the investigation is over, that varies a lot by jurisdiction. And that's something that, again, you'll want to uh, look at the particular law, whether it's state law or whether it's federal law. So again, check, check and see what the law is and check and see whether it's changed lately. So again, we talked a little bit earlier about common law, and that's basically the law that is articulated over time, literally over the centuries, by the judges based on um, kind of overarching and underlying legal principles. Again, many of them actually go all the way back into the, um, the ancient British common law, really almost to the Middle Ages. The, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court has said it's clear that the courts of this country recognize a general right to inspect and copy public records and documents, including judicial records and documents. And the U.S. Supreme Court said that in a case involving President Nixon and a situation where um, a media company wanted some information relating to the president after he was no longer the president. It's interesting, uh, President Nixon in the 1970s really uh, kind of in many ways, a lot of the, the events of that time had a huge effect on really taking principles that might have been generally understood and generally agreed on. And uh, because of some of the high publicity and controversy about some of those issues, a lot of our modern day law as to both accountability and privacy really all has been articulated largely from the 1970s forward. Privacy. Um, again, the U.S. Constitution has no explicit guarantee of privacy of information. It does seem to, in many ways, implicitly recognize it, but it doesn't really spell it out, and it doesn't really have clear parameters or boundaries. The courts do generally recognize some dimension of a right to privacy, but they tend to have a very hard time really defining it in any detail. So. Um, and again, modern interactions with government mean that the government holds a tremendous amount of sensitive information about individuals and businesses. Something else, um, and this is something where the law is really struggling to understand and address and even catch up with this. In the law, there was this concept known as practical obscurity, and that meant that your records that might be over at the courthouse and might be in some town location, some county location, there, there was all this information about each of us as individuals and it was out there, but unless somebody was really bound and determined to spend the time or money to dig it up or to hire somebody to dig it up, it really almost was, um, it, it had a certain amount of effective privacy even if it didn't have formal privacy just because it was so spread around and took so much effort to find and copy. Um, as we all know with the extent to which information is now available in digital form and how easy it is to search information in digital form, that has really changed to a huge degree. Um, and this is something that the law has really struggled with to catch up. There's some things that do offer clear protection about, say, social security numbers and so on, but a lot of records that used to be effectively private just because it took so much work to find them are no longer actually private, and it's a tough balance to figure out how to deal with that.
So we talked earlier about carrots and sticks, um, and again, the federal government most often tends to create requirements by way of carrots. They say, we'll give you some money to the state or local government, but a condition of that money is that the state or local government agree to some terms that Congress has set. One of the real examples of this is the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, known as FERPA. It applies to all schools at every level from elementary through the university that have taken federal funding for education. And it provides basically that no educational institution shall release detailed information about a student unless there's a consent from the parents or in the case of an adult student, the student themselves. Um, Virtually all schools of all different sorts have taken some part of federal money, and so they're generally all subject to this. Uh, but again, it's, it's not something that's a mandate. If a school actually said, no, we don't want any federal money, then this law wouldn't apply to them. Uh, again, it's exceptionally rare that anyone has done that, but again, this is, this is a case of a carrot. Now, then, then there's the interesting question about what happens when a federal carrot clashes with a state stick. We talked about the fact that um, nearly all of the state public records laws assume and dictate that all public records are, are open unless they are specifically exempt. And then, you ha so you have that situation where virtually everything is available. There was this um, interesting situation a few years ago. The Chicago Tribune newspaper began to do a investigative reporting on a situation where children of politically connected people apparently were getting favorable treatment getting into the University of Chicago. The newspaper asked for some of the details of the admission records. The university responded that it couldn't give these things out because of FERPA, and the university had definitely taken federal funds, so there was no question that um, FERPA was in the, the picture. Um, what, so the, the, the university said that FERPA prevents disclosure. What's really interesting, and a lot of people, uh, this was kind of a wake up, and as we'll talk about, it's still not fully resolved. The lower federal court said that FERPA really is not a mandate because a school of whatever sort could choose to not take federal funds, and if it made that choice, then FERPA would not apply. So it said that the university actually has no basis to withhold the records requested by the university without running foul of the Illinois public records law. This has then been appealed to the Federal Court of Appeals. Um, that's in the Seventh Circuit, and it has some particularly um, highly respected judges for both intellectual rigor and interesting writing. So it's going to—I I took a look even this morning to see if the, the the actual argument of the case took place back in September. I took a look this morning. I keep watching for that decision. I kind of thought it would be out by now, and um, we're all still waiting. It's just one of those interesting instances where there's. Uh, clashing mandates and clashing priorities at different levels of government. So here is a federal stick for access to information. Um, the National Voter Registration Act requires that local governments maintain for at least two years various information relating to the, the voting programs and so on, and basically so that the the election process can be accountable and transparent. So this is a situation where the, the federal government has mandated access. So here's a stick for access. Then we've got a federal stick for privacy. This is the Driver Privacy Protection Act. Sometimes it's referred to as DIPA. Um, and this is something, it, it's interesting, some states were in the practice of taking some of their driver's license information and actually selling it to telemarketers and other promoters. There was a tragic instance, I believe it was in California, where a stalker used the ability to get into driver's records to actually find out details of the person they were stalking, and it ended up in a tragic death. Um, in, in the wake of all of that, Congress stepped in and prohibited states from selling any of the information in the um, in their driver's license or motor vehicle registration records. So in this case, Congress has prohibited that, and there are criminal fines and penalties. So that's, that's a federal stick for taking care of privacy. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about litigation. Um, it's interesting. Most of us grow up with TV or movies um, thinking of litigation as a situation where there's that huge surprise at trial, that aha, the ambush, you know, bet you didn't know that we know. 
what's interesting is that's really largely a fictional artifact of the movies. Um, ever since the 1940s, most of the United States legal system has been based around a process known as discovery. And in that process, before anything gets anywhere near trial, both sides are allowed to exhaustively interrogate each other to produce any relevant information. In the modern world where we not only have paper, we have digital files, we now have social media, we have blogs, tweets, Facebook, um, pretty much any of that is fair game if it's relevant. And relevant, at least at that early stage of litigation, is defined extremely broadly. Um, this raises a couple of concerns. The biggest concern is in order to adequately respond to this, you have to know what you have. And if you don't know what you have, you need to go through everything that you have. And it's really kind of remarkable how sometimes until one is faced with a demand like this, it's really, you don't even realize what you have. And it can be a real nightmare of an experience to suddenly realize that you have to comb through all of your paper, all of your file shares, all of your SharePoint if you're using that, all of your email, all of your blogs, tweets, et cetera. Um, and even things that might not be allowable at trial may be things that you have to give to the other side before trial. So um, this is really getting out ahead of the problem is really critical. Um, something to realize is that legitimate records management, as long as you're disposing of things based on an appropriate standard, and as long as you're doing it in a consistent way, it's perfectly fine if you're then later faced with a lawsuit or a public records request. It's perfectly fine to say, we used to have that, we don't anymore, and these are the standards that we consistently apply, and that's why we don't have it anymore. The moment you face a lawsuit and know you face a lawsuit, or you even, um, the legal standard is if, if you reasonably anticipate a lawsuit, even if it hasn't arrived on your doorstep yet, or an audit, or a governmental investigation, then routine records management, disposal of records, all has to be stopped in its tracks. So um, your, your best opportunity to manage your information is to do it in real time as you go before you end up in the middle of the problem, because once you're in the middle of the problem, you can no longer use your standard retention schedules. Increasingly, there are many situations where the cost of dealing with complex unmanaged information during this process known as discovery can actually approach or exceed their direct stakes of winning or losing a case. Um, this includes sometimes people have to bring in consultants to help search, uh, something that I think is also a, a huge and often unrecognized cost of failure to manage information is what I've heard referred to in other contexts as the opportunity cost. Just the extent to which you have to set down your regular work and spend hours or days or weeks combing through information when if you had actually taken a lot of that information and managed it and in some cases legitimately gotten rid of it, you would know what you have and it would be much easier to know whether or not you even need to look through certain things. Um, another thing to be aware of is that the courts increasingly impose sometimes some very, very stiff penalties for errors or omissions in responding to discovery. These can range from some pretty huge financial penalties. Um, I'm aware of cases where it's gone into the hundreds of thousands of dollars or where one side has cost the other side a lot of money looking for things that shouldn't have been that hard to look for. I think sometimes it's even gone well into the millions. Those are obviously cases where um, there's a lot at stake, but it's just a, it's a real sobering thing to realize. There's a, um, there's a line from a court, and I really like this, um, a judge wrote in one of his opinions saying, information management is not a dark or novel art. In other words, really kind of taking the other, the, the side that had bungled things to task, saying that, you know, this is not rocket science. This is something that in this day and age, the courts expect not only that you know what you have and you know where to find things, but that it shouldn't be terribly costly. Um, and the, the courts apply a particularly strict standard to government in these regards. So again, I information that you might have legitimately cleared out prior to litigation, but that you didn't manage can sometimes really be the very thing that can come, come back to haunt you at trial.
And this is a favorite quote of mine from journalist Edward R. Murrow. Um, sometimes as I was putting together the presentation, I was thinking, oh boy, what a, what a mess of conflicting standards. And as, as Edward Murrow said, anyone who isn't confused really doesn't understand the situation. Um, and I find that people that are really quick to shoot from the hip saying, you know, here's the answer, of course this is the answer, of course this applies or this doesn't apply, um, are often at risk of making some perhaps a little bit too precipitous judgments as to what's available, what's not, what's exempt. Um, it, it's really important to kind of take a deep breath and step back. And again, um, the field of records management, I think, can be a huge asset to both the private and public sector in getting getting these things sort of sorted out before you hit the crisis point. Um, but if, if you find this all complex and bewildering, uh, that is really just a reflection of the, the fact that some of it is complex and bewildering. So then um, often when I'm talking with people in state and local government, they say, okay, well, you've told me all of this, uh, all of these standards, you know, how long do I keep things? And it's actually relatively rare for either the Congress or state legislatures to have spelled out precise retention durations. There are some particular areas I mentioned earlier, some of the areas of elections law, um, sometimes state law has certain things on certain topics, but most often the legislative bodies of Congress or a state legislature have actually delegated to some part of government to set retention standards. Here in Vermont, it's the agency that I work for, Vermont State Archives and Records Administration, which is part of the Secretary of State's office, and in particular, the state archivists are given the authority to set standards, and we're trying to, we're trying to modernize standards here so that there are, things are more clear, things are more practical. For those situations where someone is in the private sector, it's even less likely that there's a clear statute. There are some rare exceptions. And in those instances, it's very important um, if you're in a business that's highly regulated, things such as healthcare, insurance, investment, um, then it's highly likely that the agencies that regulate you at the state and federal level probably do have some standards of one form or another as to what they require you to keep or how long they require you to keep it, and you really want to check with that. Definitely check with your legal counsel for their assessment of what you need to keep and how long you need to keep it. I would give the caution, even speaking as a lawyer, that there are many, many lawyers who have the view that, okay, we should just keep everything and we should just keep everything forever because that way we'll never have to wonder about whether we've had it. I would say that, that um, e even though that view is very common in the legal field, if you run into that, I would encourage you to um, respectfully but vigorously push back against it. Lawyers often have a very limited view of the information landscape because they, if they're dealing with transactions, they're really putting things together on the forward end. If they're dealing with litigation, they tend to deal with problems after they've already become problems, and it's a somewhat reactive mode, and lawyers rarely I think it's improving, but I think lawyers really view the uh, the information landscape as a ecosystem, and I think if you look at it as an ecosystem, you've got to clear out the you've got to clear out the things that are dead and rotten, um, and so that the, the the new information can be found and can thrive. Um, so if you run into one of those lawyers that's saying just keep everything forever. They actually probably are not really fully informed even of what's increasingly best practices expected by the courts. Um, another thing, accountants and auditors are somebody that's really important to check with. I know that, again, this will be something where I'm preaching to the choir, but there's a huge number of people in that field that just say, oh, well, of course, we keep it for seven years. And as I know from working with records management folks, that uh, it, it's almost that seven years is almost treated as suspect because it tends to be what people say when they really don't know or when they just assume. But uh, nonetheless, accountants and auditors do have a lot of valuable perspective and sometimes know the details of the regulations of a particular field. So again, the uh, the what if, it's, I just always like to reiterate to folks, it's, it's really a bad idea to keep everything just out of fear that somebody will ask for it. 
I, I've sort of been cruising along here because I want to leave some time at the end for questions or comments. Something else that I just want to touch on, and again, I'm probably preaching to the choir with folks that are already in the field of records management, but many, many times I hear people say, well, wait a minute, why do I even need, you know, why do we need records management because we can just save everything to hard drive or we can burn it to DVD or put it under enterprise vault. And what I try to point out to them is technologically you can perhaps keep everything forever, but the trouble is if you've kept something and then you're faced with a public records request or litigation discovery, you'll have to provide it. Worse still, in order to respond to any of those things, you would have to know every single item or type of item that you have or you have to spend time going through it. I know of one major government agency that I think probably 15 or 20 years ago, somebody did, there was literally an entire floor of a large building that contained a lot of detailed documents and somebody said, wait a minute, this is a waste of resources. We're going to get rid of this stuff and we're going to get rid of it by scanning it. And these were very detailed documents, so they were scanned to image files. And in the name of efficiency, I forget if they were temporary employees or contract employees or anyway, they, they were people that really had no particular background in records management or even in the topics that this agency works with. And so there's an entire server full of image files that represent that entire floor of the building. Unfortunately, nobody thought on the front end about the fact that there needed to be naming conventions, there needed to be metadata, there needed to be other finding tools. And so much of that information is still sometimes needed, and when it's needed, some people have the very thankless job of, the, 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 pe the people that have this thankless job have kind of come to know the files well enough to at least have a, an educated hunch of where to look, but they literally have to open them file by file by file. Um, the good news is that similar files are often in proximity with, what, with each other so that once somebody kind of finds the right section of that vast trove of information, they can at least know that the other things are going to be relatively close to it. But that to me is one of the ultimate examples of um, keeping everything without managing it can be a real nightmare and that's a case where something that people thought would be a solution created problems that were uh, probably worse than the original problem of just having a lot of filing cabinets. Um, the other thing, and again, I'm probably preaching to the choir, speaking with folks that are already in the field of records management, but it's really quite staggering how technology marches on and we're, we're accustomed to whatever we have today. Whatever we have today is so much more advanced than we had even a few years ago that we tend to think that if we, um, if we save it to floppy disk, you know, that was 10 years ago, if we burn it to CD, um, but I, I know of situations where there's punch cards in a vault and those were set aside because it was state of the art at the time and I don't know where you'd even find a punch card reader. I know of situations where there's five and a quarter inch floppies from back in the days when floppy disks actually still flopped and, uh, you know, you'd, you'd really have quite the, um, quite the interesting adventure to even find a machine that had a five and a quarter inch drive and then find, you know, make sure that it actually had the operating systems and software to recognize the files and render them in some kind of usable form. So people tend to sometimes view technology as something will solve everything. I don't want to sound in any way anti-technology, but it does take it does take a new form of diligence to really stay one step ahead of the obsolescence or merely the uh, the, the accumulation that that um, and we're back to what I like to talk about as unplanned opacity when you just end up with so much information that it's really almost impossible to keep track of what's in the mix. So um, again, technology can be a solution, but we need to not assume that it solves everything. When there's too much information and nobody knows what's there, it becomes incredibly hard to use for outside persons. It also creates a much bigger risk that you will inadvertently disclose information that you shouldn't have. Um, recently dealt with a situation where somebody was facing a very broad public records request for um, anything that might be in an email for years and years and the thought of searching through the email was so daunting that the person said, well, can I just give them all my emails? And I had to point out that they needed to be very careful because if they had indeed kept all of their emails for 
that many years that there quite likely could be other things in there that would be exempt or sensitive. Um, so they really had the, the unfortunate task of needing to go back and comb through things. And, and again, I try to say to people, it's really important to you know, not wait until it's a crisis because then it's already out of control. If you can get one step ahead, it really pays off. So again, the, uh, the opacity of unmanaged information, it makes it much harder to find and provide information that should be provided. It makes it much, much harder to protect information that should be kept confidential. And this is something else I like to point out to people. It makes it a whole lot harder to instill confidence in others, in the people that we serve and work for and with, that we're really either making information available or protecting the information that needs to be protected. And disposing of the information that's no longer needed is really almost as important as identifying and locating the needed information. That, that's what keeps the whole system from kind of caving in of its own weight. Here's something else that I like to point out to people. It, it sometimes is daunting with as complex as all of these legal standards are. It's very daunting and people have the sense which may be accurate and um, a good sign that they're thinking about these things, they say, well, oh my goodness, I'm never going to get this all perfect. I just can't quite, you know, I can't be sure that I'm going to get all of this right all of the time. And what I like to point out is that as long as you're managing records consistently and in a good faith effort to comply with reasonable objective retention standards, then it's okay to say that we previously disposed of that. And while you can't count on it, I would say that most often from what I've seen, um, someone who's requesting records or the other side in litigation or a judge, if you really show that you've made a diligent good faith effort but there's been a, an inadvertent and innocent error that's taken place in the midst of that effort, then the, the, the thoroughness and the diligence and the sincerity of your overall program goes a tremendous way in helping people understand that that error or omission is inadvertent. So it's, it's really, it's an incredibly valuable investment to take care of this stuff as we go. Again, um, consistency is key. I've seen instances where there are record schedules and they're not used or they're used for some things and not others. And I really try to point out to people that, that that's its own set of traps. And I like to remind people of um, back about 10 years ago when the big energy firm Enron collapsed and turned out to largely be a case of fraud. Their auditors and accountants were the firm Arthur Anderson. At the time, Arthur Anderson was one of the biggest firms of its type on the entire planet. And um, somebody at Arthur Anderson, as all this was, as the chips were all falling, somebody said, oh, wait a minute. And they sent out messages saying, you know, be sure that you've applied the record retention and destruction processes. And all of a sudden, a bunch of records that had not been deleted in the normal course and in ways that would have been legitimate if they had been deleted in the normal course were all very suddenly deleted as the scandal unfolded. Um, Arthur Anderson ended up in federal criminal prosecution. Um, I'll skip the whole details of that, but what's interesting is regardless of how the legal case turned out, the public and business sector confidence in Arthur Anderson was so devastated by a lot of things, including that um, kind of, you know, we're not going to destroy things and whoops, now that things are going badly, time to, time to invoke our, our retention and disposition policies and let's clear things out. That, uh, that pretty much destroyed their credibility and they're gone. They're no longer in business. So again, perfection is not achievable, but really the critical thing is to make a good faith effort and document your systems, document what you're doing and why you're doing it. Not necessarily in uh, excruciating detail, but just to show that you are making this a priority and that you're trying to do it objectively and consistently. Um, that way, when controversy arises, and it surely will in some form or another, you will have that that evidence that you've done things in a, a good faith way and you've tried to make available what should be available and to protect what should be protected. And with that, I'll try to, try to wrap it up. I um, want to leave some time for discussions or questions.
Thank you very much, Trevor. That was very interesting. And uh, now I'd like to ask our audience uh, if you have questions to press the uh, raise hand uh, button and I'll call on you or else to just enter your question in the chat area and I will read it for you. Let me read the question from Lisa. Uh, what is the best way for one to handle a local courthouse that is not very forthcoming with records. I do quite a bit of genealogy research and am required to answer many questions as I look for my own uh, family records. So uh, we'll look at that question first, Trevor. Sure. Um, I guess a couple of things. One, one thing I would encourage you to do is try to become familiar with the details of the law in your state. Um, there are some instances I'm thinking sometimes genealogical researchers like to look at school records and we talked earlier about the, um, the, the federal FERPA law. So there, there's instances where people are trying to be careful and trying to do their jobs as best they understand them. Um, if there's a situation where somebody is just plain being recalcitrant or stubborn, I would try to find out more about how the um, how the court system is structured and see if you can respectfully go to um, whoever is sort of the, the next level up, not necessarily the individual that's the next level up, but um, perhaps like here in Vermont we have something called the Office of the Court Administrator and it oversees the courts in general. They can sometimes look at things on more of a big picture level. Um, so that just uh, some thoughts on that. Lisa had a follow-up question before I go to the others. Uh, she usually uses deeds and wills and she was wondering how you approach uh, workers who ask why she wants those records. I have to be careful because I don't know what state it is and I don't know the law in detail in most other states. I've done a little work in New Hampshire. but. Um, I would try to find out if you can and you may want to check with, um, there, there's probably somebody in state government that is kind of the repository of information and references for public records access and see what they've got. Uh, it, it often is the Secretary of State um, or some portion of the Secretary of State or the State Archives which may or may not be part of your Secretary of State. There, there may be some resources there that um, talk about the, the law and your rights and I would try to look those up and that way you'll kind of, and it, particularly if some of those materials support you then you can sort of draw the staff's attention to those things. Um, I, I would say in the jurisdictions that I'm familiar with, there really there is not a basis in most instances for people to ask you why you want the records. Um, there's some rare exceptions to that with trade secrets and so on, but that that wouldn't be the case with genealogical records. So I hope that's at least helpful. Thank you. Uh, just to add that she's in Tennessee, but I know that that's uh, something that she can deal with now that you've given her such good information. Uh, the next question is from Shari, I believe, and uh, she wants to know, has the Patriot Act changed how records are stored or retained? And I would love to be responsive to that, but I, I rather than give incomplete or misleading information, I have to say that because I've largely focused on things at the, um, the, the state level and only moderately at the federal level, that's an area that I don't know that I have particularly full or complete understanding of. So I, I wish I could give more of a helpful answer, but um, I, I expect there's probably some resources on that and I, if I knew them, I'd point you to them, but again, that's a little bit outside my realm. And it sounds like that might be a topic for another uh, colloquium, so I'll keep that in mind. Uh, the next question is from the New York State Archives. What's your position on preservation of attorney-client communications and other legally privileged materials and their disclosure by an archive? Yeah, that, that's a really interesting area and that's an area that in particular I would say that it's very, very important to get to know the details of your own state law. Um, Attorney-client privilege, like other privileges, um, you know, the, the privilege between spouses, the privilege between a person and their clergy person, all of those are um, often of very ancient origin but are often 
highly tailored and differ a lot from state to state by law or sometimes by court rules. Um, I'm not familiar with the details in New York, but it's, it's interesting. There are some states that actually have pretty much come right out and said that in those states there is no attorney-client privilege at all between the government and a lawyer for the government. I think that, and that in terms of that, that's kind of maybe the uh, the, the ultimate taking of a certain direction in public accountability. Um, there's other states that take the view that there's a, an attorney-client privilege for as long as the matter is still actually a pending matter, but that sort of that it dissipates when it's completely resolved and becomes something in the nature of past history. Um, it is a really important thing to look at carefully, though, because you do get instances where people argue that if the attorney-client privilege is waived as to one communication or in one situation, aggressive litigants will try to argue that it's waived on a much broader level as to other communications. So you're, you're entirely right to um, proceed with caution. And I guess it looks like that question is from the New York State archives. I don't know if there's somebody that you could speak to in your um, state attorney general's office that might be the place to, to start to get their thoughts on, on the best way to proceed. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to read just one more question now and then uh, close our proceeding here because our time is up. And then uh, the speaker and I will stay on just for a minute or two later if someone has a pressing question after we close. But the last question uh, then is by Carrie. If you have to deal with medical records of patients in state institutions, how would you determine whether to keep the entire patient file or a summary? We have issues between trying to consider the needs of medical history researchers and trying to preserve space and reasonable access. And of course, the records are highly restricted. The last question, shall I read it again? Um, it's from Carrie. And um, if you have to deal with medical records of patients in state institutions, how would you determine whether to keep the entire patient file or a summary? There are issues between the needs of medical history researchers and, of course, of um, preserving space, reasonable access, and making sure that the highly restricted uh, records remain so. Thanks, Pat. I, I fumbled the talk button when I first tried to answer that, so thank you, and thanks everybody for your patience. Um, I would suggest that you speak with the, the legal counsel. This sounds like it's from somebody who's working within that state medical institution, I would try to speak with your own in-house legal counsel, um, perhaps also with your county or um, state attorney general, see what their thoughts are, and then also find out who sets the retention standards in your state. Again, it may well be your state archives um, or some form of records administration and see if they have a record retention schedule already established. If they don't, maybe ask them if they can come up with one. And then um, something to realize, and this, uh, this is only a very, very vague concept. Um, in some instances, when it comes to medical or personal information, the privilege is basically considered to exist as long as the person is alive, and the privilege sometimes goes away when the person dies. That can sometimes be a little more complicated in that with very sensitive issues, the, the privilege can be viewed as extending to family members also. So you really want to get a sense of what the law is in your jurisdiction. As far as making things available for the researchers, um, that's a, it's a noble thing, but I, you know, that's not necessarily something that you have a mandate to preserve. So I would suggest get some input from legal counsel and your archives and records people. Thank you very much, uh, Trevor Lewis. Um, everyone, give him a round of applause there.